Thanks very much for inviting me to the ARIS Symposium. Uh, I can't uh, be with you in person, but uh, I'm trying out uh, something that's uh, technological, technologically new for me. And so uh, you'll be seeing me uh, via the magic of the big screen. And uh, I'll be joining you later for an audio conference in the panel discussion. Uh, when I was asked to talk about uh, our climate change, I was suggested to look at the topic of mitigation versus adaptation. And that's certainly a common focus for discussion. But what I want to argue today is that uh, this is in fact a false dilemma. And I'll explain uh, what I mean by that uh, uh, during the course of the talk. So for those who don't know me, I'm John Quiggan. I'm a, a Federation Fellow in the Risk and Sustainable Management Group uh, at the University of Queensland. And, and we've been established with a grant uh, from the Australian Research Council uh, to investigate uh, sustainable responses to climate change with a particular focus on the problems of the Murray-Darling Basin. To find out more about us, you can read uh, our websites. Uh, the Risk and Sustainable Management Group has one uh, covering uh, all our working papers, annual reports and so forth. Uh, it also uh, contains a, a blog uh, with uh, thoughts of what we've been doing. I have a personal website at the University of Queensland. And finally, I have my own blog, uh, uh, which you're welcome to read uh, posts on uh, issues of the day. And if you're so inclined to uh, visit and uh, make your own comments and join in the discussion. So what are we talking about uh, with uh, global warming? Well, there are, of course, uh, a wide range of climate models out there uh, giving a range of projections of what might happen under business as usual uh, and a range of uh, alternative scenarios. Uh, I've got uh, a list here from uh, an IPCC report. Uh, we've got a range of projections from um, relatively optimistic moderate change of uh, two degrees uh, relative to the uh, uh, relative to the present, maybe three degrees relative to the historical baseline, up to a change of five to six degrees. Uh, that's a pretty big range of uncertainty, and it's sometimes argued that um, it's sometimes argued that uh, that kind of uncertainty uh, provides a reason. Uh, for doing nothing or for waiting to see about climate change. I don't believe that's correct. Uh, in fact, given the uh, convexity of the damage function, uh, the fact that um, uh, the damage from four degrees of warming is much more than twice the damage from two degrees of warming, and that five to six degrees of warming is uh, potentially catastrophic, uh, the range of uncertainty provides a strong case uh, both uh, for global action for mitigation and for uh, individuals, businesses and governments in Australia to consider uh, how we might begin to adapt to climate change. So uh, economics and climate change, well, uh, economists were the first to raise alarm about issues of resource exhaustion. And in this context, uh, the exhaustion of the Earth's assimilative capacity, in particular, the capacity of the atmosphere to absorb carbon dioxide, uh, is uh, the ultimate limiting resource, arguably, on uh, global economic expansion. Of course, uh, Malthus uh, famously raised concerns about population in the early 19th century, and uh, Jevons uh, uh, raised concerns about the exhaustion of coal supplies in the late 19th century. Uh, so uh, it's uh, certainly um, somewhat annoying when uh, economists are accused of uh, failing to consider these issues. Of course, uh, we've been thinking about them for a very long time. Uh, but uh, we've also been the first uh, to take a more hopeful view of the problem, uh, to look at the ways in which uh, technical change and the uh, price mechanism uh, can uh, potentially uh, address problems of uh, resource scarcity, uh, including uh, the kind of environmental scarcity associated with climate change. Of course, uh, as uh, the price of scarce resources increases, uh, we economise on them, uh, find alternatives, or uh, simply consume less. Uh, technology can uh, make resources go further, and these two interact in the sense that um, if we have uh, substantial price increases, uh, that induces the uh, adoption, uh, th that induces technological innovations uh, which uh, tend to save the scarce resource. And certainly that uh, doesn't um, uh, suggest complacency. Uh, it's only a year or two ago since uh, we were assuming that uh, uh, simply autonomous technological change would solve all our problems without any need for a price on uh, CO2. I think that's a, a, a gravely mistaken approach, and I'm glad to see that uh, uh, it's been abandoned, um, abandoned by the Australian government and doesn't seem to be being uh, seriously pushed any longer. 
So uh, the topic of my talk, mitigation and adaptation, uh, here I'm going to define uh, mitigation as actions to slow the growth, uh, the accumulation of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. And most obviously that means uh, reducing uh, the burning of uh, fossil fuels, uh, carbon-based fuels that generate carbon dioxide. Uh, but of course there are a range of uh, other greenhouse gases, other sources of, uh, uh, and sinks for carbon uh, dioxide emissions that all need to be considered. So uh, the biggest of the non-CO2 greenhouse gases are, are methane, which um, uh, largely arises from agriculture, from uh, ruminant beasts and from uh, rice paddies, and there are uh, various possibilities for reducing methane emissions. Also CFCs, uh, chlorinated fluorocarbons, which uh, have been uh, largely uh, eliminated from new emissions under the Montreal Protocols, uh, but uh, uh, still remain as uh, a significant uh, source of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Uh, in addition to uh, emissions of gases on the mitigation side, we also need to look at, um, at uh, sinks uh, what are sometimes called offsets. Uh, that's the capacity to absorb CO2 from the atmosphere, uh, most obviously uh, through uh, planting trees, uh, but also potentially through improvements in soil management uh, could include uh, increase the capacity of uh, soil to uh, uh, fix CO2. Uh, so all of those things uh, which reduce the global, uh, the global burden of greenhouse gases, I'm going to call mitigation. Uh, not, ex not limiting that to uh, reductions in emissions. Adaptation is um, the things we do uh, to respond to a changing climate. Uh, obviously, uh, uh, we're, going, we're going to see a good deal of this in agriculture, and that's what I will be primarily talking about. Uh, if we see sea level rise, then we need to adapt either by uh, moving further inland or by uh, reinforcing our houses or some combination of, of these actions. And so there are a whole range of actions which are going to take place in the form of mitigation. Now these are often posed as competing alternatives uh, and that's been um, particularly true in the context of the rather polemical political debate that has surrounded climate change uh, until recently in Australia and, and still I guess to some extent uh, and also uh, still continues to uh, rage particularly in the United States. In this context uh, uh, people who for one reason or another don't want to undertake any mitigation have argued, uh, have used adaptation as a sort of code word for doing nothing. Uh, they haven't in most cases actually come up with much in the way of, uh, of uh, uh, proposals to improve adaptation. They've simply said, well, we'll just uh, adapt. Uh, this line, for example, has been pushed in uh, Bjorn Lomborg's uh, recent book, uh, Call It. Uh, that's produced a, a corresponding reaction to some extent uh, on, uh, on the other side of the debate where um, uh, adaptation has been viewed with suspicion, anybody mentioning it has been suspected of uh, being a secret opponent uh, of uh, action to mitigate uh, global warming. And so we've had this uh, uh, false, uh, this dichotomy between uh, mitigation and adaptation. Uh, I want to argue uh, today that that's a, a false dichotomy, a false dilemma, uh, and I'll uh, illustrate that point uh, with reference to uh, my main area of study uh, and one of uh, significant interest here in Adelaide, the Murray-Darling Basin. So I want to argue that um, uh, mitigation and adaptation are complements rather than substitutes. Uh, first, uh, if we uh, recall uh, the extreme projections of, of, um, of climate change, and of course under business as usual, those aren't going to stop uh, suddenly at 2100, they're going to continue, uh, then um, Sooner or later, climate change will outrun our capacity for adaptation. Uh, it seems reasonable to suggest that uh, uh, with uh, two degrees of warming, there's uh, capacity to adapt in various ways. Uh, at rates of uh, three degrees and more, it becomes just about impossible for a lot of uh, natural ecosystems like uh, the Great Barrier Reef uh, to uh, adapt in time to uh, respond to uh, steadily changing um, uh, temperatures. Uh, beyond three or four degrees and the capacity of uh, uh, human life support systems, things like agriculture, to, um, uh, to adapt become uh, more and more questionable, as we'll see with the particular case of uh, the Murray-Darling Basin. On the other hand, um, 